proud to join Representative Lipinski in co-sponsoring this important legislation. And I want to thank the three of you for your patience with our unpredictable voting schedule. Uh, I, I, I too want to follow up on this discussion, this very important discussion about workplace develop, workforce development, because it really does seem to be, in a lot of ways, the linchpin. Um, in Connecticut, we are working very hard on these same issues. I have a longtime manufacturing district which is struggling with this. And I am hearing from manufacturers in my district like Ward Leonard in Thomaston and Access Technologies in Farmington and Alltech Electronics in Torrington, and hearing directly from the, these same questions about certification programs, access to training programs, credentialing issues. Um, and frankly, one of the issues that we have been struggling with is the legacy of having lost these manufacturing jobs in the past. And we have been looking at this issue about young, about young people who might be very interested themselves if they knew more about the salary ranges, what the work entailed, but their parents or grandparents may be deeply suspicious because their experience was so bad with these jobs having been lost. Now, that being said, you know, from your perspective and experience, what do we think the best way is to engage? young people? How do we bring them in? Is this something we should be looking with getting better teaching and more exciting teaching in elementary and secondary school and STEM technologies? Should this be around apprenticeship and training programs? You know, what can you suggest to us is, is the best route to go? I'm assuming that's for me. Um, yeah, I have an interesting perspective on that. So we have done some uh, summer camp program at, at TMA. That is one of our first steps. We now do a, a program for young kids. I think they are in fifth grade and sixth grade, and they come to our summer camp program on manufacturing. In fact, it is going on right now. It is a two-week program, and a lot of what we do is we take them to manufacturers and show them the high-tech manufacturing. It is computerized. It is one person operating multiple machines that are doing multiple operations. It is really high-tech stuff. I think as manufacturers, especially small ones, we sell ourselves short and forget to say we are high-tech. We really are. And um, so that is one program we have done. Also, we have put together a pamphlet. Uh, I had the pleasure of uh, having um, uh, Sunny Hoyer came to visit, and uh, we were able to show him at TMA the pamphlet that we have uh, for, for young people. And what it does is it shows different careers and different wage ranges and salaries and the training you need to get there. So you can see that if you spend a few thousand dollars and take a couple months of certification programs, you can come out right away making thirty, forty, even fifty thousand dollars a year as a machinist. And that is where you get the parents excited. They say, Boy, I don't have to load up on thirty grand in college debt, I can take uh, a few thousand dollars of training courses and come right out and be working. So uh, I think that is important to get the parents on board, because I personally have hired people and had the young person ready to take the job, and the parents said, no, you are not going to go work in manufacturing. That is not the career for you. So um, I think that is important. Also, we have a Women in Manufacturing Committee at TMA who is working with the Girl Scouts to get uh, a program going, uh, get, getting young girls into uh, engineering and STEM programs. So I don't know all the details of the program because um, they are just putting it together, but that is something that they are working with the Girl Scouts in the Chicagoland area, again, at a very young age. And actually, for all of you following up on this, we have discussed previously in this subcommittee the German model and looking at what Germany has done in its vocational training. And for all three of you, if you could suggest to us whether you, what lessons you think are learnable by us for best practices for, for beefing up that relationship between the business community and the educational community to provide those skills we need now. Well, I can, I can speak directly to that, having lived in Germany for three years and, and worked in a, a chemical facility there. Uh, I, w I was able to participate in the, in the training program there. I, I think, look, we have to have the appropriate apprentice and training programs here in the United States. We do it a little bit differently here. Uh, in Europe, many times the companies will take multiple years of apprentice programs, but people also commit to working their whole lives with the same company. Here, here we have the dilemma of people moving company to company more. And this is where I think there is a great opportunity for partnership between uh, private enterprise and the government. In the state of Indiana, we have a terrific program through the Ivy Tech uh, vocational schools at Barry, uh, we take tremendous advantage of that. Those kinds of voc and and we also provide a lot of the the financial support for that in addition to the to, to the government. So I think those kinds of government uh, industry cooperations can be a terrific part of what this bill is all about. 
I would just add that, you know, the workforce boards in each state have access to significant funding um, from the Department of Labor and that we really need to ensure that those resources are being aligned with the demands and needs that are coming, you know, from the employers as, as a first order. Secondly, um, there are a number of very uh, innovative, advanced uh, labor unions. Um, I will mention the pipe fitters and plumbers in particular. I, I know that union very well. Um, its president's uh, very active in the Council on Competitiveness. This union, you know, does very high skilled work. They do the welding on nuclear subs. You go through their training. They pay for everything. You get a certificate as a journeyman welder. You make, depending on where you are in the country, sixty to eighty thousand a year. They're bringing that training to our military bases for returning veterans, and it's a very strong partnership with the companies that use pipe fitters and plumbers. So that collaborative partnership between business and labor needs to be extended to other parts of the economy. And finally, I would say on the engineering issue that was raised, um, STEM is absolutely critical. We know that. But we also need to take the E in STEM and blow that out. Because at the end of the day, everything we're talking about requires engineering, design engineering, engineering that goes through the whole product cycle. And um, we are not elevating the engineering discipline in this country to the way we, we can and should. Um, the Council on Competitiveness is making this a very thrust, big thrust. We're teaming with Lockheed Martin to create the National Engineering Forum, which we hope over time will become the Davos for engineering. But engineering is something that needs to start, you know, in K through 12 and really be elevated the way it was at different times in our history. Um, I'd love to follow up on that last point uh, and relate it to all, for all three of you. First question is on the role of basic research and in manufacturing in particular, if there are areas that, again, that the Federal Government has an important role to play in basic research. So that's the first question. And the second one is this linkage that you just mentioned, Ms. Winsmith, about the linkage for deployment. Uh, we have some vigorous debate going on. We had votes this afternoon that had to go exactly around this issue. What should be the role of the Federal Government in deployment of, um, of technologies and of research that is being developed? So love your, your thoughts on both of those questions. Thank you. I will just use one example that captures it. I had the opportunity two weeks ago to be at University of Toledo in Ohio. And coming from Akron, I knew Toledo, but I wasn't aware that this university really did all the basic research for the genesis of the solar industry, built on their glass history and things. And, you know, they created first solar, came out of um, that entity, but, you know, all the manufacturing, all the infrastructure went to China for a lot of the capital cost regulatory issues. So somehow we have to link this basic research where we le still lead the world in many areas with the conditions for ensuring deployment. And that, of course, gets to the power of government procurement, state procurement, as well as perhaps even, and this may sound a little um, pushing the envelope, but why can't we think the way some of our competitors do about creating some advanced manufacturing zones where there are huge privileges and opportunities to be the first users of these capabilities? I, I heard in Toledo, they have a plan to create buildings that will be net zero energy with the next generation solar panels. How can we make that happen? So it is exciting, but um, we have some challenges because the rest of the world is looking at our basic research as the seed corn for their next generation products and services. And we got to make sure we capture the value here as well. One of the things that would be helpful to follow up on is this question, which I think you are absolutely right about State and government pro procurement being part of that investment by the society, by taxpayer dollars in the society, ensuring we develop those robust markets here, not just the te technology that then is produced elsewhere, but that we put our bang for the buck behind it to get to scale, because we aren't getting to scale, and that remains a problem. And it's not good enough just to develop the technology and license it to the world, or worse yet, have them steal it and take it and develop it elsewhere. So, so helping us and think about the right way to, to do those procurement rules so it doesn't be picking winners and losers. You know, how do you develop criteria that is not picking winners and losers and yet is putting a goal out there 
that our great engineers and scientists work towards to achieve and then bid on and take advantage of, as you mentioned, Mr. Model, we have to find a way to incorporate the value of producing it here, the value of those jobs, as compared to the value of paying people who can't find work. And, and we need help on that, uh, because it isn't, part, it isn't part of our calculation now, and I think it should be. When you look at what is the lowest cost producer for DOD, you should estimate the cost of not employing American engineers, the cost of not having visas for high-tech students who came to this country and would love to stay. Well, there is a great uh, quote by Abraham Lincoln. I am going to butcher it a little bit on the numbers, though. He said, uh, you know, we could buy our rails from England, and we will have the rails, and they will have the gold, or we can make the rails here for maybe a little more expensive. I am butchering the numbers. But uh, he said, then we will have the gold and the rails. So we need to think about that and uh, that, that value. But, um, you know, when we talk about the tech transfer, we had a unique discussion here before about Argonne Labs. I'm right there. Uh, my, my company is right nearby, and they brought myself and, and some other small manufacturers in and said, hey, we have all these patents and technologies. How can we partner with you to get them? We scratched our heads and said, you know, we just don't have the capital. As a small business, access to some kind of low-cost capital where I could use that money and, and tie up this technology and, f and have the time to figure out how to use it where they said, you know, a lot of Korean companies buy up all their patents, in particular one company, and they have a lot of cash, and I don't know if that cash is somehow supplemented through government programs, but that's, they're getting a lot of the technology simply because they have access to the cash. And if I had the ability to have the cash and the time to play with the technology, I know I could, you know, companies like mine could work with it.